Well, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rick Revor. I'm director of our Sandbolt Center for Ethical Leadership. This event is sponsored by the Sandbolt Center. The center was created through a gift from Minnesota Power to honor its retiring chairman and CEO, Sandy Sandbolt. And we're fortunate to have Sandy and Verna with us here today. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's an honor to, to introduce our new uh, leader in chief of Duluth, Mayor elect Emily Larson. Uh, she graduated from right here, St. Scholastica, with an undergraduate degree in social work. She holds a master's degree from UMD. Uh, for several years, she worked uh, at CHUM with uh, individuals and families who were homeless or at risk of being homeless. She currently serves as president of the city council. She's a commissioner of the Duluth Economic Development Authority, and she's worked as a consultant for nonprofit organizations. She's worked tirelessly to improve our community. I'll just mention a few things. She's worked to secure funding to increase summer youth programs. Uh, she's worked to increase library hours and services. And she's been instrumental in helping businesses to expand the Duluth. Um, January 4th, she'll be sworn in as our new mayor. And she's Duluth's first female mayor. So welcome back to St. Scholastica, Mayor Black Larson. So. Introduction. I've gotten to know Rick over the last few years. I've never been in a classroom while you're teaching, but you look comfortable and, <laughs> and easy to listen to. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for hosting the series and providing the opportunity. Um, my name is Emily. I'm really happy to be here today. And I have to tell you, I was elected a month ago to the role of mayor, which I'll start next month. And I've gotten, hey Lucy, <laughs> fun to see you. Uh, and I get a lot of invitations to speak, but I'm not taking very many of them. I was just talking with Bob in the front row, and he said, I bet you're really busy doing all of these speaking engagements. And what I found is that I'd love to do this, but I am pretty selective about it right now. It takes time, it takes energy, and I'm really focused on trying to prepare and be as effective as I can in January. But the two, uh, the two invitations that immediately, they were the easiest yes for me, was this one at St. Scholastica and the speech I gave last week or the week before at UMD for the Commission on Women. And the reason those are so easy is because these two places mean so much to me. And I, I know that without St. Scholastica, I know this is gonna sound really corny and like I'm doing a paid ad, but the truth is, Without St. Scholastica, without the Benedictine Scholarship here, I, I would not have been able to afford college. And I know I wouldn't be here uh, as mayor, as mayor-elect, or as a leader in Duluth. And the same is true for UMD and what they've afforded me. So, um, so this was an easy yes. And my plan today, I have some notes here. I'm going to kind of go through them. Rick gave me some thoughts on how to, uh, how to approach this. I think I'll talk for maybe... 25, 30 minutes, and then I want to hear your questions and hear what you would like to know more about this role. So that's kind of my plan, and I'm real happy to be here today. So I would love to see a show of hands of uh, those of you who were are born and raised here in Duluth. How many? Okay. And then I'd love to see a show of hands of those who were born and raised outside of Duluth. So, well, you all are welcome here. <laughs> and I should have raised my hand with that second question. I was not born, and I was not raised here in Duluth, but I have chosen Duluth as my home. And like, like many of you, uh, perhaps, you know, we don't choose where we're born, but we choose where we call home. And I want to tell you about my first time here in Duluth. I was five years old, and it was a vacation. I was born and raised in St. Paul. We lived right by the railroad tracks, and so... That was always the place that we went, over to the tracks and watched trains go by. And my mom went over there with my brother and sister and I, and we're watching trains go by, and I think probably putting uh, quarters down to watch them get smashed on the tracks. And she said, ah, one of these trains goes up to Duluth, and one day I'm going to take you on one of those trains, and we're going to go up. And she took us up here with my dad. It was the one and only family vacation we had was coming here to Duluth on the train and I don't know how many of you ever had a chance to ride this train that connects these two cities. It does not connect right now. Hopefully at some point it will again. But 
The experience for me as a five-year-old, the one and only family vacation coming here was really, really magical. And we had our suitcases. We got on the train at the depot in downtown St. Paul. We got off it at the depot downtown Duluth, dragged our suitcases through downtown to the Holiday Inn where we stayed for a few days. And so that vacation really burned in my mind because uh, it was really special for us to go somewhere to get out of town and then we found here. And we spent our days downtown at the soda station, you know, Woolworths or uh, down on Superior Street. We threw rocks in the lake, we ate ice cream. It was really, really <coughs> magical. And that was 1978 which wasn't a real magical time here for Duluth. There was a lot of economic hardship. Businesses were fleeing, people were fleeing, people were not seeing Duluth as a place to invest and attend and go to school and live their lives. Uh, and many people who were here were losing opportunities because plants were closing down that had offered really, really good jobs. So for me, uh, Duluth kind of got embedded in me at that age, and it was when I got the chance to go to college that I chose Duluth, and that was it. I never looked back. So I moved to Duluth when I was 17 to go here to St. Scholastica, and I chose here because I could afford it. I loved Duluth, and uh, the nuns stepped forward, of course. The sisters stepped forward and provided me with a Benedictine scholarship, and that is what made this possible. And after graduation, I got a job working at Chum, like Rick talked about, working at the drop-in center with families who are homeless or at risk of homelessness and spent my time there uh, really listening to people's stories. I spent 12 years working uh, with this population, helping kids get into school, helping women stay safe from domestic violence, helping families get into housing and apartments and find jobs. And for me, that was a really, really transformative time in my life, one of the most important times in my life, actually, because I learned the value of really being present to people, where they're at, what they're doing, and what I can do to be there with them. Uh, so I did that for 12 years, and after which I kind of went through the place many people go, many of us go to, where you realize there's a lot of issues in the world, and I'm putting really great Band-Aids on them but I'm not really getting to the root of the issue. And so I chose to go back to school at UMD, get my master's degree, and then I started doing bigger community-based work. Uh, and I started working with organizations. I, I continued to work with CHUM and with other nonprofit organizations, but rather than the client being an individual, the client became my community. The client became those organizations. And so I spent eight years doing that kind of work. And along the way, I got involved in politics and I got in involved in policy making on a local level. When I was growing up in, in St. Paul, my parents were very, very politically active. We really did not have money, but we had an enormous uh, amount of riches when it came to people and when it came to interactions. I, I grew up with 40 first cousins and those were my friends. That is who I spent all of my time with. And um, our house was filled with people kind of coming in and out talking about issues and talking about, you know, um, boycotts or other things that were important to them. And I remember uh, being outside of the living room and kind of hiding behind the wall while, while everyone's having a political discussion in the other room. I don't even remember really what it was about, but I remember crouching down on the other side of that wall as an eight-year-old girl listening and really wanting to be a part of it. And I would find these ridiculous reasons to interrupt <laughs> my parents and asked for a glass of water, all the stuff that now as a parent you realize eight-year-olds can fully do on their own. But at the time, really wanting to engage and kind of hear and get involved in that. And so that was really part of my core. So the idea of running for office took hold after I had been active in politics here locally. Uh, one of the things, actually one of the first political things I did was here on campus. And I was a student. I wish Dr. Goodwin was here today because he may not even remember this, but um, I, was he dean? Was he dean of students for a while? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what I thought. And when I was a social work student here 25 years ago, um, I went to him uh, with an idea of where I wanted to have my internship. And it was at Planned Parenthood, and I wanted to do an internship around reproductive health and not so much a political decision about um, you know, a, a pro-life or, or pro-choice agenda, but it was really about women's health issues. And um, 
So it was not available to me at the time. And so that was actually my first kind of political action, I think, really, was sitting down with the Dean of Students, made an appointment, and made my case. And we had a really great discussion. And he sat with me openly and talked about a whole bunch of different things. And we actually ended up finding a middle ground that worked really well for both of us and provided me with the opportunity I was looking for, which was to engage in women's advocacy and women's health. Uh, so that's interesting. So along the way, you find these political outlets that you don't even know are political. You know, you're not even really going to make a, a, make a change necessarily, but there's something in you that pulls you into an issue or pulls you into an area of concern. And so that idea of ad advocating for myself as a student turned into advocating for others as a professional into social work and then has emerged into advocating for my community now as an elected person. So when I first ran for city council, the story I'd really like to tell about running for mayor is that I actually never intended to run for mayor. And most people I know don't, uh, don't dream of running for office. Most of my colleagues on the council, I don't know if I've heard anyone say, I always dreamed about being a city councilor. Or when I was little, I wanted to grow up and be a city councilor. Most people get into this work because they connect to an issue and they want to make change and they want to make a difference. There's something happening in their neighborhood. There's something happening down the street. There's something happening across town that kind of gets a fire in your, in your gut, gets a fire in your belly, and you want to talk about it, and you want to organize about it. And those are the public servants that make the best kind of change because they're in it for the right reasons. So I really enjoyed my time on city council. And actually, when I ran for city council, I didn't intend to do that either. Um, and I want to tell you about that because um, I think it's important to know that leadership will take you in a, a variety of directions. And when I was sitting in your seat as a student when I was 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, if I had been asked, will you, do you think you ever will run for office, I would never have raised my hand. But what this place has taught me, what UMD taught me, what, what, um, student life and learning taught me is that you step up when there are opportunities and you will find yourself in the path of leadership. As an educated person, you will find yourself in that path and it is incumbent on you to take the opportunity. If you have the skills to serve your community, you need to be willing to do it because your community needs you to say yes to those opportunities. So five years ago, when there was an opening on the Duluth City Council, I'd been asked to run before by friends and colleagues, but it never quite uh, fit into my plan. And at the time, my kids all along the way, my kids were young and, and busy, and it just kind of wasn't what I was thinking about. And, uh, but I looked at the makeup of the City Council. We have nine members on City Council. And five years ago, um, I looked and I didn't see a demographic I was hoping to see. And at that time, I had done a lot of political work and organizing work. I had managed some political campaigns. I'd done a lot of work on issues, non-partisan uh, non issues, and done a lot of organizing around that. But uh, I, so I was actually out recruiting somebody else to run for city council. And I was offering to manage their campaigns, and I was offering to work on their campaigns. And I remember this very clearly because I was at home in the kitchen, and I was saying to my husband, you know, I cannot find anyone to run for this seat. And I keep asking, and no one wants to run for city council. And my husband's at the stove, and he's cooking, and he's stirring something in the pot, and I can't remember what it is, but it smells great, and we're talking in the kitchen. And, and he uh, says, okay, tell me again, tell me again, what are you looking for? And so, and I say to him, oh, I'm looking for um, a female, under 40, uh, politically active, has kids in the school system, uh, you know, knows something about business, but is also, you know, mindful of the community. And so my husband set that spoon down <coughs> and turned the heat off and turned to me and said, well, let's do it. Because here's the reality. What, part of what you're identifying is part of who you are, and, and you really don't have the right to ask other people to step up if you're not willing to do it yourself. And so that was actually the first, although I'd been asked before to have that conversation with someone who knew me so well, who knew my heart, who knew, who knew my mind, who knew what I would give to it, meant a lot to me. And so we, 
ran for city council, won that seat four years ago, and ever since I have worked, uh, Rick mentioned a few of the areas that are really important to me. I've worked real hard for parks and for libraries because those are universal services that the whole city relies on every zip code, every age, every gender, um, and so I'm really passionate about those universal services, but I also have certain capacities uh, that support small businesses and expand economic development. Um, and so I'm telling you all of this because what I notice is that when I tell my story, almost every time I tell my story, somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, you know, when you said that part about this, or when you told me the story about that, that reminded me of when I was a kid, that reminded me of my mom, or that reminded me of my neighbor, that reminded me of something. And so some of the questions that Rick has given me to think about for this series and this opportunity with you, it's been about what is that path into leadership and what are the leadership skills that you look for. And my path to leadership is not unlike the path all of you will be taking into your own leadership. And my path into now moving towards the mayoral seat and now moving in to be the mayor of Duluth wasn't necessarily something I set out to do. But when I knew that our, the mayor we have now, Mayor Don Ness, wasn't going to run and there was an opening, and I thought about the direction of the city, and I thought about my vision, and I thought about what I had been hearing from the community for, for the four years I'd been serving. What I'd heard from people who live on our margins, what I'd heard from people who are out in the neighborhoods, what I'd heard from small business owners, I knew that I had something to offer. And I knew that I had to offer, and it wasn't gonna be up to me whether I would get that job. I knew that all I could do was get out there and be who I am and talk about what, what I'm passionate about and inform myself and arm myself with allies who could help inform me. But in the end, it was not going to be up to me. It was going to be up to 86,000 people in Duluth who get to make that decision. And I can tell you that when I announced, I was terrified. And I don't mind telling you that, and I think it's really important to be honest about that. I remember the day I announced, my husband and I standing there, and we purposely announced in a place that was comfortable, and we didn't have a wall of people, and we didn't have our kids there. I have two sons who are 12 and 15 years old, and we purposely didn't pull them out of school. We kept it very straightforward. This is what this campaign is about. This is the vision. We're announcing this now. We campaigned for a year. And I was shaking and excited and nervous and thrilled and proud and exhausted. <clears throat> but spent a year uh, campaigning and door knocking and building a vision that won in a citywide election uh, just last month. <clears throat> So I want to talk a little bit um, about what the campaign was like for me, but I also want to talk with you about what I see as really strong leadership skills, and I get asked this a lot. I have to tell you that when I ran for mayor, when I first announced the idea of being the first female mayor did not factor in a bit. And what's been fascinating for me is the impact that that has had over the last several weeks, really right before the end of the campaign. I didn't even really talk about gender at all. It was not a piece that was a motivation for me to get into the race. But the more I ran and the longer I ran and the closer we got to the election and then right afterwards, I see the meaning of that for our community. And I feel the meaning of that for women in our community, but also for men in our community. And I believe so strongly, so, so strongly that um, changing the face of leadership, broadening the face of leadership, broadening who can be a leader in any community, that is really, really important. It's important for my sons, just as important for my sons as it is for your daughters or your sisters or your mothers to see that leadership can be all of this and to see and know that the burdens we sometimes bring in, the gender politics of burdens that only leadership can look like this and only leadership can look like that, it boxes us in and it doesn't allow us to grow and it doesn't allow communities to grow. So when I was looking at these questions that Rick gave me about what, what does make a great leader, 
I have to tell you that my one answer is that the great leader is you already. And what I mean by that is I have, when I first uh, got into politics and serving as a public servant, people want you to be who they want you to be. And they will tell you who they think you should be. They will tell you that you can't win. They will tell you that you are wrong. I have had people tell me it takes more than a pretty smile. You're not smart enough. You haven't been doing this long enough. You've been doing this too long. You're too much of an insider. You don't know enough about business. You're too business. Well, in the end, I just decided to be about what I'm going to be about. And what I found is when I talked about the issues that matter, when I talked about community health, when I talked about um, the disparities between neighborhoods, when I talked about the fact that there are neighborhoods where people in Duluth are living with significantly smaller incomes, where their life expectancies are shorter because of the disparities of incomes, people understood that I was passionate about them and their neighborhoods. When I talked about growing small businesses and ensuring that that comes with good, good, well-paying jobs, people understood that I was listening to what their needs were. And so my biggest message today, if you are a student or an adult or moving into your own path of leadership on campus or outside of it, is to remember that your path to leadership, your leadership skill is actually already here. And that being told what to do doesn't make you a better leader. Finding out who you are, listening to that core of your ethics and that core of your learning and your head, that is the passion that will inspire people to move with you on an issue. That is the passion that will inspire people to partner with you, to join with you in a vision, to actually vote for you. And I, I can't think of anything more personal kind of maybe because I'm a political junkie, but there is nothing more personal to me than my vote. And when somebody asks for it, I'm going to expect a lot from them. I'm not going to expect they're going to do what I want them to do all the time, but I, I do hold people to very high expectations. And I can tell you that people in Duluth do the same. People in Duluth are very clear with me when I've made a decision that they support, and they are real clear with me. <laughs> when I make a decision that they don't support. And sometimes they tell me very loudly. <laughs> and that's okay. That's what it is to be in community together. And what I've found, I know that the College of St. Scholastica talks a lot about ethics, and we should, because the ethical dilemmas and ethical conflicts are everywhere. But the older I get, I'm 42, the older I get and the more confident I get in following the path of who I am, I find that my ethical dilemmas become less and less. And that doesn't mean that decisions get any easier. I have to make decisions that are really difficult for me all the time. On the city council, we make decisions about land use. We make decisions about whether or not somebody can build a, a garage or whether a business can expand. We talk about issues that affect people's daily lives. We talk about how much you are going to pay every month to help fix the streets or how much you're going to pay every month to, to pay for your utilities. We are the place that helps you get your hot water and your cold water that makes sure that when there's a snowstorm, you can get to where you need to go. So these are really personal decisions that we make. And I find almost every council meeting, the city council meets twice a month, and I, I find actually almost every council meeting there is a difficult decision. But it's not necessarily an ethically difficult decision. What's hard is when you know that you will be disappointing people. People in Duluth invest a lot in their public servants, and they should. They should expect a lot because we have asked you for your trust and your support. So what I find is that uh, ethical dilemmas decrease in intensity the more you know what your moral compass is. And the clearer you can be about who you are, the more transparent you can be about your decision. It's really hard for me to make some decisions that I know affect people's jobs, and I know affect people's pocketbooks, and seniors on fixed incomes. I know that I am making some of those decisions, and they're difficult but doesn't necessarily make them an ethical dilemma. I can tell you that when I've been faced with the most ethical, ethical uh, dilemma, the, the largest ethical dilemmas for me have often been um, 
around personal relationships. And when you know someone and you don't agree, that's okay. So it's how you navigate those conflicts that I think bring the best kind of result. There are three elements in my life that have, I think, prepared me the most for leadership. And um, the first, actually, is my parents' divorce. When I was 10 years old, my parents separated and divorced. And they did it really, really well. And you don't hear about that very much anymore. But my parents were married for 20 years, and they worked really hard on their marriage. And then they worked really, really even harder on making sure that they had a divorce that valued a family experience, even if it wasn't in one house. And I have to say, as a parent, I don't know how you do that. I am not sure how they were able to manage that. But my parents, despite the fact that they could no longer share a home together, met weekly, talked about the kids, never sent messages for one parent through kids, never talked disparaging about the other. And that taught me an enormous amount about conflict. And the fact that we can be in conflict with each other and still have a relationship. That we can be in very, very different places emotionally or financially or socially or politically and still find the important ways to have common ground. And so what I've learned through my own political experience and personal experience and actually what my husband just said to me the other day was, you know, when, you, when there's conflict, a lot of people, you know, if this is the conflict, a lot of people will kind of walk around it. And he said, you know what you do, E? You walk right towards it. And I do. I, I find conflict interesting because I actually think it's, it's likely that you feel strongly about this and I feel strongly about this. And so there's something we can work with there, even if we might end up in different places. So that is one experience that at the time was really difficult, my parents' divorce. Uh, but when I look back and I realize all that I learned from it, I am so grateful to have been taught the value of real human relationships that are difficult and messy and, um, and that you can retain that covenant of relationship with someone despite having enormous conflict together. The second uh, experience that was really transformational for my own leadership was learning the value of listening. So like I'm a little uncomfortable that I'm even still talking. <laughs> I know that the thinking on public servants and politicians is that we love to talk, but this exhausts me. And I will do it because I enjoy it. But it's not in my natural wheelhouse. If I could flip this room around, I would. <laughs> and I would ask you questions because I actually think it's likely that you know more than I do on a variety of things. I walk into this room fully assuming that I know some information and that you know more. And that it's on me to ensure that I'm listening, that I'm not just showing up, but that I'm actually showing up to hear your story. And I learned that skill through social work. I learned that skill at CHUM. When I listened to people's stories, I heard unbelievable stories, like seriously heartbreaking, still catches me in the throat stories of people's childhoods and the experiences they had. And I didn't have that kind of fear in my own life as a child. But when I listened to their stories, I could still connect with it and I could find the human connection, and I could find the struggle, and I could find the survival in their story. And once you make a connection with someone in their story, you are connected. You can't break that. You have a responsibility to each other. And so that's my, that's my view of community. We have a responsibility to each other. And uh, it starts for me with listening and the humility to know that, um, that you know more than I do, whether you're older or younger, more experienced, less experienced, you got something I don't. And you're gonna make me a better person, a stronger, smarter leader, a better friend, a better mother, if I can stay present with that. And the last thing for me that continues to make me, I think, an effective leader, hopefully a good leader for the city with others, is that I have embraced fear. 
And I say that with kind of that fake voice because it's hard for me to say. But I told you that when I announced for mayor, I, there, a part of me was terrified. And then as the campaign went on and candidates come out and you're having debates and you're building coalitions and you're working with people and people are supporting you and people aren't supporting you, I became fearful of winning and I became fearful of losing and I finally just said, bring fear in. Because all it does is slow you down, knock you off your game, and the reality is everyone is a little terrified of something. And so what I found is that every time I can embrace that, uh, I was scared to be a mom, I was scared to be a grown-up, I had these moments for me that had been terrifying, but every time I decided just to embrace it, things got better, and I got stronger. And I left that knowing more about myself and feeling more ready for what lies ahead. And so I think that's one of the biggest things that I've learned to do for myself, and I continue to embrace it. I have to do a lot of things that I'm not always perfectly comfortable doing. Tomorrow I, I uh, get to go meet with the governor, and then I'm going to be on the statewide television show, and I'm a little terrified about tomorrow. But I think it'll be okay, and I think it'll go well because I'm... I'm prepared and ready, and I'm very ready to be imperfect at what comes ahead for me. And understanding that imperfection and knowing your imperfection is a great, great place to start. So um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up pretty soon. Uh, but I do want to say that... Uh, I remember going home the first few times when I started school here 25 years ago. Uh, and I would go home to St. Paul and come back. And I don't know how many people go back and forth to the metro area a lot. A lot of people, pretty much. Okay, and it still takes my breath away. When I get to Thompson Hill, do you know what I'm talking about? You get to the top of the hill by Spirit Mountain, and you look over, and it's this lake, and it's, it's the city. It takes my breath away. And every time I get there, I say a little, a little frame, a little phrase of gratitude to myself that we live in this beautiful place, this river, this lake, these people, the story, the story of our land, the story of people who have lived here for centuries, that we have so much we can do in this city. So I'm so honored to be here today, and I find more and more that when I think back on my time at St. Scholastica, when I came here, it was much smaller than it is now. And one of the shocks for me, I grew up in St. Paul, like I said, and I lived in a very diverse neighborhood, a diverse community. My family is very diverse. And I came to Duluth, and I was shocked. It was the whitest town I had ever been in. And I am really excited to see how educational communities are, are evolving. <coughs> We have work to do when it comes to equity and racial justice in Duluth. Uh, our world is changing just as this campus is changing, and I'm so excited about that because I think that is really, really good for Duluth. But when I first came here, the population was really small here, too, at St. Scholastica. And I had classes that uh, were taught by these wonderful, tough-as-nails nuns, two students. You could not skip a class, and you couldn't skip a lab, and there was no getting around, getting your, getting your work done on time, and being in that class awake. There was no screening out. There was no way to check out. You had to check in, and I needed that at that age. I needed a community to really challenge me, to push me, to make me think, to make me learn, and to integrate learning. So what I found as a social worker it's a generalist degree, meaning that you're working with everything. It's very broad. It's very liberal arts. It's very Benedictine. The values of the Benedictine community. The values of social work. They're similar to the values of education. The values of nursing. And the thing that will make you really good in those professions isn't knowing everything in the books. You, we need to do that. you got to know the science of nursing. You have to know the theories of education. What will make a difference, though, what will motivate your patients and your students and your colleagues is the passion. And that you cannot find in a book. That gets opened up 
in places and communities and campuses where you can break through those moments of fear, where you can find your own leadership and you can believe in yourself. So I'm really so honored to be here today and um, I would welcome any questions that you have. Streets are really expensive. I think we could all give examples of what's not working in our infrastructure. So this is a challenge. It's a challenge for economic development. It's a challenge for neighborhoods. It's a challenge financially. And, and leading up to a few years ago, the city of Duluth had a dedicated fund, a dedicated stream of revenue that we used for streets that is no longer available for us. So the idea of recalibrating that has been really difficult for us as a city. And I actually think one of the things we have to do is really talk about how do we want to prioritize that because it is expensive. Now the state and federal government has disinvested in transportation all over, so Duluth isn't the only city that deals with that. But So that's definitely one of the top ones. And I think it's one of the ones that people will most often share with me as their biggest concern. Uh, the, the other concern I would say is, is equity across our city. And what I mean by that is ensuring that people across the city feel connected to what's happening. One of my favorite things to do when I campaign is door knock. I love it. I would door knock all day, every day if I could. And when I went to people's doors, they would say, thank you. Thank you for stopping. Thank you for noticing me. Thank you for coming into this neighborhood. So we have a lot that we need to do to make sure that all neighborhoods East Duluth, West Duluth, Piedmont, Park Point are really strong neighborhoods of opportunity, and not all of them have the same opportunities for families. And so one of my ideas around that is to really ensure that, uh, we're probably, that we make greater financial investments in certain neighborhoods than others. Some neighborhoods are doing okay. There are, there are other neighborhoods that really need a lot of our attention. They need a lot of our public safety attention. They need a lot of our youth programming attention. So ensuring that we get a better experience across the city doesn't mean that we spend the same amount of money in every single neighborhood. To me, it means that we spend more money in the neighborhoods that need it. Thanks for your question. So Duluth has 23 colleges, 23,000 college students is the last thing I heard. You know, one of the things that's been really neat, so when I went to school here, it was really campus-based. And I don't know if that's your experience now, but there wasn't a need to get off campus, there, unless you were going to a party, which I never went to. <laughs> um, but other than that, you stayed on campus. And so what's been neat to see, like now St. Scholastica is building a building over at Bluestone, UMD is moving downtown. So, I feel like the campuses are finding more and more ways to integrate into the community. I don't know if the city's always done what we could to make sure that we're embracing that. And so I know there are mentorship programs that go on with the chamber and other things. But um, you know, I think we have to build that strategy together. I don't have ready ideas about that. One of them would certainly be housing. I'd love to see more housing off campus, actually, even a dormitory downtown or those kinds of things where students have an opportunity to really dig into the life of a city. Um, but I actually think it is so much better than when I was here, because it was very siloed at that time. But do you have ideas, Mary? I would say more internships. I mean, yeah. I think that, you know, employers grew that, and they looked at the paid internships yeah. as much as possible, maybe even short-term projects. Yeah. 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 And again, I agree with you. I think that has changed the mental program. Big impact on a lot of our students. Mm -hmm. So more of that. 
Well, and you know what will happen actually is the more people get off, off campus, the more they see that Duluth can be their home too. So when I went to school here, people left. I was the only person in my cohort, my like friend cohort, who stayed at Duluth at that time when I graduated in 1991. And it was not the place that people stuck around. They didn't think the jobs were here. And there was no connection to the city. You know, there was no need to, maybe we went to the mall or something, but it was very destination based. And so the more we do that, actually as a city, that's, that's what I want. I want people graduating feeling like this, I am sticking it out. I'm gonna find a job because I know work is here and I know the city is wonderful. So, it, yep. <laughs> Emily? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the advent of the San Bernardinos and the other uh, horrific acts that are out there must make you think about what would happen if, it, what would we do if it happened here? And it can happen anywhere, apparently. So it's, it's scary in that respect. And just one or two people can, can do this. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if it's preventable at all, or I think the social structure that's integrated will help a lot. Mm -hmm. But, uh, there are always outliers, of course, so I don't know. I don't have any comments on it other than it's a big problem and for all of us. Well, so I've been thinking a lot about Minneapolis lately, yeah. and I don't know if you've been following oh, so yeah. much what's down there, but... Precinct 4. Precinct 4 mm -hmm. shooting and then um, some subsequent shootings and protests. I've actually I've been thinking so much about Minneapolis because... I agree with you, Sandy. These events can happen anywhere. And so it's partly how you respond to events and it's partly how you work as a community to prevent them. And I do think that when people don't feel that they belong, when they don't feel that they have opportunity, when they don't feel like the city or the power base is listening to them, people get desperate. This is, that can be what happens, is that when people feel like, gosh, no one is listening to me. <laughs> that you do big things to then get hurt. And so that's actually, for me, that concern about neighborhood equity, that's where that comes from. When I'm door knocking neighborhoods and they're saying, no, I feel like no one's listening to me. You're the first person who's come to my door to ask me this question. Part of what I'm hearing is I'm looking for a place to belong. You know, and when, I, and when you belong to a community, you take care of it and you take care of the people who are in it. So for me, that, that Discussion about neighborhood equity isn't just because all kids should have a safe place to play, although that's important. It's about the message that sends to the families who are taking care of those kids. Yeah. 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 Um, from your time, like in school, yeah. was one thing that you wish you would have done more? Well, I wish I would have traveled. Actually, that's a very expensive answer to give you. <laughs> and that's why I didn't do it. I didn't go to Ireland. That was the only travel program we had at the time. I didn't go there because I couldn't afford it. But now there are service projects and service trips. I kind of wish I had done more of that. And that's only because uh, when I was 24, I met my husband. And then we, um, he already owned a business. I didn't even really talk about my family. But um, I'm married to uh, someone who owns a business in town here. And so he'd already owned a business and we had kids. and. And all of a sudden, it's just a lot harder to do that stuff. So that, that's one of the things. And I think the travel for me isn't so much about um, the fun of it, but it's to see the world and see how you fit into the world. To see that when you go to Ecuador or Paris or wherever you're going, again, that story sharing and that storytelling, every time I travel someplace, something reminds me of home. And something reminds me of my own childhood or something. So I think the more people can experience that, the in America, we have this view that we're really a sheltered country, and the rest of the world doesn't have that because there's more integration, there's more crossing of borders, there's more interaction, and so I think it's especially important for Americans and American students to have the opportunity to just blow, blow that a little wider. Bob? Yes. <laughs> uh, much of your story speaks to the importance of relationship building. Yep. And I, I'm interested in terms of, um, a, as mayor and representing a large organization, what are the relationships you'd like to build between the city and 
yep. other institutions throughout the community. One may be education. That's right. That's right. Education, healthcare, those kinds of things. So the question is about relationships. And I do practice from a relationship-based kind of economy, actually. That is what I do. I invest in relationships. I spend a lot of time talking and listening to people, especially if we disagree. I will call people back. I know they're mad at me about something. If I have a tough vote on a Monday night, I am usually on the phone before 8 a.m. on Tuesday morning calling people who I know are frustrated or mad or, you know, and I don't surprise people. I don't all of a sudden flip my vote and surprise people, but I reach out right away to say, okay, what's, how are we going to navigate this and how should we move forward? So the role of mayor is critical in the relationships that a city has. And uh, so the relationships that I would prioritize include one with the Fond du Lac Band. That's a very strained relationship right now and a really important one for us. And so we need to navigate some litigation and other issues around that. Um, certainly our St. Louis County partners, our legislative partners, the governor, you know, when you invest in those relationships, it literally translates into money. We get 40% of our budget comes from the state legislature every year. And so if we are not working incredibly hard to maintain strong working relationships with the governor and with our elected officials, regardless of what side of the politics you're on, if they don't know what you're up to, if they don't know what your priorities are, if you're not communicating well, you're losing 40% of your budget. So, so there's that kind of external relationship that the mayor um, does, but the, the role of mayor does not happen by itself. So then there's also the internal relationships of the organization. You are only as good as the organization you're working in. The mayor has 855 staff that work for the organization. And so if you think of it from the organizational level, um, those are pretty priority relationships to have within City Hall to get things done. Yeah? Um, so Duluth has done a lot of things in the last decade to try and attract more young professionals to come into Duluth. Mm -hmm. um, the most recent example, I think, is the, the all the mountain biking trails and all the, the investment in that. Looking out, and as you're trying to attract, uh, build up the equity across neighborhoods, um, I think you need to do that by building up a, a middle class. Yes. What What do you see as some key priority areas trying to attract people to come into Duluth? Um, okay, so I have a few answers to that. So I'll just kind of start, and I think I'll end where you want me to be. Um, it, the city of Duluth, our, our median age, our, our median age is uh, 34. The median age for the whole region, including the Iron Range, is 44. We are, excuse me, 30. We are 36 years old here, 44 in the Iron Range. We have a very significantly different age base here in Duluth, and it's important that has grown over the last 10 years. It's very, very different than what it has been. And I think part of it is because the message, the messaging around Duluth is that it is a place of opportunity and choice, that many people do live here because you can access the boundary waters and the lake and the quality of life issues. So I have been a supporter of our trail system. Um, but I also would like to see us move from expanding trails to maintaining them because that's, you know, what we see is if we don't maintain things like our streets, the erosion continues, continues. So when it comes to quality of life things, what we need to do is invest to ensure that they stay those great resources. The trail system that we have in Duluth, I can't remember the percentage, but um, a vast majority of, of residential areas in Duluth are within a quarter mile of a trail. And that's important because it means that people have access to the outdoors and opportunity. And the new conversation around that is something called the adventure gap, to make sure that people who don't have uh, disposable incomes to buy a flashy bike um, still have the opportunity to access those quality of life things. To, so we need to broaden the benefits so that it's not just a middle class luxury item that people do. Um, but how we incentivize and keep that base, right? That's part of it. We have a housing issue that is part of the problem, right? So I don't know if you are a homeowner or a renter, but we do not have enough housing to meet the demand. And we don't have enough housing in the, in the right buckets to meet people's demand. And the risk of that is that people will move to Proctor or Hermantown or Superior or Two Harbors. And those are great places to live. But my job is to support the city of Duluth. And I want to have as many people living here in this city, paying taxes, buying things. You know, I want that experience for people here. So... 
So there are several strategies actually around how to expand our housing um, and how to improve. We have a really old housing stock, so what we can do to improve that. So what I find um, when I'm listening to people who move to Duluth or are in that age bracket, what I'm hearing people look for is our housing options, a good job, and things to do. And so we're covering some of those really well. We're not covering them as well as we could, especially in the housing option. Yeah, thanks. Anything else? Mm -hmm. um, I know this is a county issue, but one of the things also I think is broken in our society is just our foster care. Oh, yeah, yeah. System. Yep. Um, my husband and I have been foster yeah. parents, and actually we adopted two little boys through the county. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah, <laughs> so we, yeah. It's wonderful, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really hard. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wonder, you know, do you have any ideas on how to make that system a, a better system? Like, you know, how to make our community better and better support for parents who are trying to raise kids and yet they, don't, they can't, you know, yeah. lose them. Or, so well, just, your experience is from the foster perspective, but you could say that about another family who might be struggling or... And um, you're right, the funding for foster care is a state and county issue, so I don't do much with that. But the reason why this is a concerning area for me, because um, if you look at graduation rates for families that are either in a foster care system or on the edge economically, graduation rates are lower. Um, and that's a problem for me uh, as an adult, as someone who lives in this community and as a mayor, because if kids aren't graduating, they're becoming adults who don't have opportunities. And adults who don't have opportunities don't have the economic, you know, the, the economic way to pay their bills, but they're not feeling very connected to the city that they live in, and that's when you get more desperate behavior. So, so I prefer a more holistic approach, and actually the school district just hired two new people to help address achievement gap and graduation rates with the idea that it's going to be more family-based and supporting families to get through that educational system. Part of what I think is hard is that um, if you as a parent did not feel particular, like as a child, if you didn't feel really supported by your educational system, it is really hard to go in there for your kid. It's really hard to go back to that building and ask those questions. If the memory of your experience of, of elementary school was not empowering, it's really hard to dig deep and find the strength to make it empowering for your kids. So there's some cyclical things in there. Some of it's definitely county and reimbursement probably in foster care base. And some of it for me is important because these kids, when they're doing well, my and they're in, I know for a fact uh, when kids in my kids' classrooms are doing well, my kids are learning better along with yours. That's important. So I see, I see why it's an issue. I don't have a solution right now. But that's kind of my value around that experience for you. Well, thanks, Emily. Thank you so much.